So, um, hello, this is, uh, this is the beach where I live. And uh, I was wandering there just a couple of days before getting on the plane, and I found this on the sand. <laughs> really, I really did. And um, I'm not a religious person, but... Um, Quite extraordinary. Uh, my name's Ray Moynihan. I'm a recovering sufferer of motivational deficiency disorder, uh, and uh, and uh, I'm also a PhD student and a um, senior research fellow at Bond University. One of the partners. I'm extremely excited, as everyone else is here, that you're all here. This is a wonderful gathering. I'm very excited that the partnership has proved so fruitful with Consumer Reports, BMJ, Bond, and Dartmouth. It's a it's a great team. Jim Guest, the CEO of Consumer Reports, will be here tomorrow and he'll be extremely happy to, uh, to see this gathering as well. We're now just moving quickly from the welcoming ceremony to the start of the scientific program. Um, and, uh, and this really is a dream come true to be introducing uh, the next guest. Soon we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Otis Brawley, who is uh, a basketball fan, among other things. Um, but, uh, but now we're going to hear from uh, Steve Wolosian and Lisa Schwartz. Uh, Stephen Lisa's research addresses the excessive fear and hope created by exaggerations, distortions and selective reporting in medical journals, advertising and health news. In collaboration, they've worked to improve communication of medical evidence to physicians, journalists and the public. Wolosian and Schwartz are professors of medicine and community and family medicine at the Giesel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, directors of the Centre for Medicine and, and the Media, at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice and co-directors of the VA Outcomes Group at the White River Junction VA Medical Centre. But most of all, as many of us know, they are two very human beings. Uh, they're indefatigable, they're funny, they're wise, they're moral, they're eloquent, they're ebullient and they're effervescent. And it's a real pleasure to introduce them. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ray. We are human beings, <laughs> that's good. To, um, so welcome to the uh, Preventing Overdiagnosis uh, uh, Conference. Um, I just wanna start by thanking our sponsors, the um, um, Dartmouth Institute, you heard from um, Elliot Fisher, um, Consumer Reports, the British Medical Journal, and Bonn University. They've made this conference possible. And I also wanna thank um, the Hitchcock Foundation here and the Norris Cotton Cancer Center for providing money for the scholarship funds, um, the steering committee, um, and the Dartmouth conference team, Cynthia, Anne-Marie, Jess, um, Loretta, and, and Judy. And I also would like to um, acknowledge um, uh, Gil Welch, who unfortunately is not here, but he's our colleague who um, we've worked with for many years on, on these issues. So we're just thrilled um, at the interest in this conference. Um, someone just mentioned we have people from, I think, 28 different countries, and actually six of the seven continents, which is pretty good. Um, and if anyone knows anyone from Antarctica, <laughs> I would be extremely grateful if you would contact them and get them here before Thursday. <laughs> um, since there are so many people from abroad, I just thought it would be important just to orient you to the United States. It's very different than uh, many other parts of the world. Um, we're very, very focused on disease. Um, and it's actually reflected in our calendar. So um, for you guys, most of you think it's September, but in the States, um, it's actually um, known as Prostate Awareness Month. <laughs> it's also known as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and actually a host of other awareness months. <laughs> and there are actually 175 officially recognized disease observances in the United States calendar. Uh, it's just one of the many efforts uh, made uh, to make people aware that no matter how they feel, uh, death and disease are lurking <laughs> around the corner. So please enjoy yourselves while you're here. <laughs> For example, Sloan Kettering, uh, one of the most prestigious cancer um, institutes, uh, in centers in the United States, wants you to know that if you feel great, have a healthy appetite, and you're only 50, um, don't be fooled. These are actually the early warning signs of colon cancer. But 
But even if you're younger, and I see that we have some younger people here, you're not off the hook because if you have skin, <laughs> you're at risk for melanoma. This was a, a full page ad that ran in the New York Times recently by a device manufacturer who, so you check your skin at the door. Um, and now you may feel a little shy with all these people from all these different countries, um, uh, but the makers of Zoloft want you to know that in fact you may have undiagnosed social anxiety disorder and they have a medication for you. But it could be bipolar disorder. <laughs> Um, and AstraZeneca wants you to help sort this out. And they actually, in their national um, educational campaign, they provide a short quiz, which uh, I'd like to take with you right now because I think it will help set the tone for the, the meeting. So what I'd like you to do now is we'll go through a few questions, and I'd like you to raise your hand if the answer is yes. <laughs> okay? So has there ever been a period of time when you were not your usual self and you were so irritable that you sh shouted at people or started fights or arguments. Oh, I see, I see yes, okay? You felt much more self-confident than usual. Oh, we have one over there, okay? You were much more active or did m many more things than usual. No, you, this is, this is unusual group, all right. And then uh, finally, um, you were much more interested in sex <laughs> than usual. Well, fa fascinating, yes. Okay, you can, you can put your hands down, okay. Uh, uh. Okay, and, and, uh, and then f f finally, we added this question, but um, have you ever seen a symptom quiz that casts a broader net than this one? So finally, we can say no, no to something. Um, fi finally, I, I, I don't know if any of the men out there are aging, but um, according to the drug maker AbbVie, aging may actually be a disease called low, low T. Um, here is the Is It Low T website, which says that the signs and symptoms of low T uh, in men may be difficult to tell from changes that occur with normal aging. So what the website says is, if you notice any signs of aging, you probably should talk to your doctor. Uh, <laughs> because they, you might want to take their drug, Androgel. Androgel has over a billion dollars in sales, so it's clearly the right thing to do. So at the break, you may want to call your physician. So the point is, it's really hard not to have a diagnosis. In, and increasingly, it feels that no matter what you do or you fail to do, there's a disease and a, and a treatment out there for you. So you know, if you're awake, and some of you appear to be awake, you may actually be suffering from insomnia. And if you're feeling a little sleepy at this point, I would worry about excessive daytime sleepiness syndrome. Um, if your attention is wandering a little bit, um, that's not good. Those could be the signs of adult def attention deficit disorder. But if you're paying attention, don't, <laughs> don't be smug. It may be obsessive compulsive disorder. Some of you may not be thinking about sex at the moment. That is a sign of hyposexual desire disorder which is, by the way, very unusual for a rabbit. <laughs> On the other hand, you may be thinking about sex a lot, in which case sex addiction may, sex addiction may be your diagnosis. And then, you know, if you have any cholesterol in your body, um, <laughs> really, you probably have hypercholesterolemia. Um, if you have normal blood pressure, I have bad news for you, you actually have prehypertension and um, we talked about skin, but if you have bones supporting that skin, um, you may well have um, oste osteopenia. So, um, what's up, Doc? Well, what's up is overdiagnosis, and, the, and that's what this conference is about. And the question is, you know, what is overdiagnosis? And it's actually a very hard question to answer. And, um, you know, it's one of those obvious things that's hard to pin down. You, you know it when you see it. And um, we hope that one of the outputs of this meeting is to get more clarity on the definition, oper operationalizing the definition and, me and, and measurement. Um, one of the problems is that there's different kinds of overdiagnosis. And here's our working definition for the different kinds. One kind is the, the diagnosis of abnormalities never destined to cause symptoms or death. Um, that, that's one kind. And, and in the screening world, that's really the, the, the issue that we face. But there's another kind of overdiagnosis, which is the medical, medicalizing of ordinary experience. 
That's particularly the issue in, 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 symptom, in the symptom world. And in each case, though, because there isn't anything to fix, people who are overdiagnosed can only be harmed by diagnosis and treatment. And that's why this issue is so crucial. The dilemma is that diagnosing important health problems can help people and feel better and live longer. I mean, that's why so many of us are in medicine. You know, we want to do that. Um, but the, but the problem is overdiagnosis represents an important reality check on what medicine can do, that there's limits to what we can do. And sometimes in our pursuit of doing good, sometimes we can do harm. And that's because all tests and treatments have harms, right? There's uh, pain, radiation, bleeding from tests, follow-up testing, side effects of treatments, um, psychological effects of, of, of uh, behavioral effects of labeling, anxiety, um, loss of resilience. These are really important issues. For the sick, the benefits of diagnosis generally, hopefully, outweigh the harms. Um, but that may not be true for the, the well. It's hard, hard to make the well better, but it's not hard to make them worse. In the next few minutes, um, Lisa and I are going to talk about how diagnosis ha overdiagnosis happens. And largely, this is about more testing, screening, uh, more use of imaging tests, more use of sensitive tests, and then, of course, broadening of, of disease definitions. Then we'll talk about some of the interests promoting overdiagnosis and then the goals of this conference, which is to hopefully wind back the harms of overdiagnosis. So we'll, let's start, start with screening. Obviously, this is a major uh, pro, uh, source of over, overdiagnosis. So screening, that's actively looking for disease in people who are well, testing people who have no symptoms to look for early, er, early hidden disease, typically, often cancer. The goal, which unfortunately many people forget, uh, the goal of screening is not simply to find more cancer. That's the easy part. The goal is to reduce deaths and hopefully suffering from cancer. Everyone has heard that cancer screening is a simple way to save your life. Unfortunately, the reality is more complicated. While screening may help avoid some cancer deaths, many more may be harmed by overdiagnosis. Um, and specifically, this means finding cancers which never go on to cause symptoms of death, why? Because some grow so slowly that the people die of something else before the cancer ever hurt them. Um, the poster child, I suppose, is uh, the early detection of prostate cancer. Um, and some cancers don't grow at all, and some regress. People who are overdiagnosed can't benefit from the diagnosis and treatment. They can only be harmed. And there's mounting evidence of overdiagnosis in breast cancer, melanoma, thyroid cancer, kidney, and even lung cancer. And it really, it's probably the rule, not the, the exception. Ironically, the more overdiagnosis that occurs, the stronger the appeal of screening. So with more cancer testing, we find more cancer. And as people see more family and friends and celebrities diagnosed with cancer, there's an increased sense of risk, which drives the um, interest in being screened. So there's more testing. More testing also leads to more overdiagnosis and early diagnosis. And by definition, these people do really well, which generates an increased sense of benefit from screening, which in turn increases enthusiasm for cancer screening. So it's a self-reinforcing cycle. Muir Gray and Angela Raffle call this the popularity uh, paradox. Lisa and I have documented enthusiasm for cancer screening a few years ago. We did a, a national representative U.S. survey, and we found that 87% of Americans believe routine cancer screening is almost always a good idea. 74% believe that finding cancer early saves lives most or all of the time. And then we found, um, we asked people, do you feel that a man in average health who did not have a routine PSA, prostate uh, cancer test, uh, was irresponsible? And in fact, 63% of people thought a man in his 50s who, who, for, who would forego screening was irresponsible. 40% thought the same about an 80-year-old man. We asked the same question about mammography for women, um, and the numbers were actually a little bit higher. So there's great enthusiasm for, um, for screening. So take-home message, screening is a trade-off. It can help some avoid cancer death, but the harms, it may harm others. Overdiagnosis is probably the rule, not the exception. And changing practice is going to be hard because doctors and the public are primed on the, can, uh, on the earlier is better mantra. And there's, there's a need for retraining to believe that screening is a genuine decision. So while screening is a deliberate look for uh, hidden disease in people without symptoms, um, you can get overdiagnosis just from testing frequently for, for any reason. 
Advanced imaging is particularly an issue. CT scans find many small abnormalities that have nothing to do with why the scans were ordered. These are called incidentalomas. Um, a radiologist uh, who must know what he's talking about because he was a professor at Harvard, and, uh, which is the, the, the Dartmouth of Massachusetts, um, <laughs> and the University of California said that after doing 15,000 total body CT scans, the realities are that with this level of information, I've yet to see a normal patient. <laughs> And we're doing lots of advanced imaging. This is data from a large US health plan with no financial in incentive to scan more. And we see that the use of um, CTs and MRIs have gone up dramatically over the past decade. And with more imaging, of course, more abnormalities are found. Um, the concern is that these incidentalomas are sus or suspicious abnormalities might, in fact, be cancer. And to find out, patients have to undergo tests, which can cause harm. Fortunately, most of the time, it turns out not to be cancer. But if 1,000 smokers got a CT of the lung, half of them, 500, will have a suspicious abnormality detected. Fortunately, only 36 will have a dangerous cancer. But there's a tremendous amount of testing and potential harm that goes into sorting that out. For, men, for people who've never smoked, um, the numbers are 150 out of those 1,000 would have a suspicious abnormality, and less than one will, will turn out to have a dangerous cancer. And here are the numbers for kidney screening, for kidney uh, CTs, and for liver. For thyroid, and here it's for ultrasound, not for CT, the numbers are even more dramatic. Two-thirds of people have an abnormality uh, that's suspicious, highly suspicious, but less than one will have a, a serious cancer. So more testing has resulted in many incidentalomas. Most are not dangerous, but the follow-up test to rule out serious problems can be. Um, and more sensitive tests can also uh, cause overdiagnosis. And just to sort of change gears, let's go to a non-cancer example, um, pulmonary embolism, potentially fatal blood clots in the, in the lung. In the old days, when we were in training, um, these were diagnosed with ventilation perfusion scans, VQ scans. And you can see these fuzzy images. They were really only good at picking up uh, bigger clots. Nowadays, um, CT pulmonary angiograms can pick up um, much, much smaller uh, clots. Um, for the cognoscenti, the isolated subsegmental pulmonary emboli. These are so small that some of them may not be, need to be treated. In fact, some people believe that clots normally commonly form um, in the legs and that it's the lungs function to uh, remove them, to, to filter them so they don't cause problems like strokes you know, in other parts of the body. Nevertheless, it's hard to be sure how much is overdiagnosis, how much is real diagnosis. That's one of the dilemmas and the challenges facing us. Um, Here's some population evidence for overdiagnosis in pulmonary embolism. Um, this graph just shows the incidence of pulmonary emboli in the United States. Um, and you can see it um, was flat for some time and then it started to go up. That uh, increase corresponds with the introduction of the new sensitive test, CT pulmonary angiography. Now, if these new increased uh, incidents, these, these clots were really the, the dangerous ones, then you'd expect to see a reduction in mortality from uh, an increase in mortality from pulmonary uh, emboli. But in fact, the red line shows that uh, that, hasn't, that hasn't happened. And we think this is very suggestive that many of the new clots may not be clinically important, that this is an example of overdiagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, complications from anticoagulation, the treatment of these things, um, has tracked with incidence. So there's, there are real harms. Um, if you want to read more, you can read our paper with our colleague, Wendy Wiener. It was the first in BMJ's new series on unnecessary so more sensitive tests cause overdiagnosis. Um, they find, um, more sensitive tests find um, less serious disease where treatment can be more harmful than the disease itself. Okay, um, so overdiagnosis also happens because of broader disease definitions. Um, expanding diagnosis reflects a fundamental problem in medicine. How do we define sickness? Most medical phenomena exist on a spectrum. At one end, people are clearly sick, and at the other end, they're perfectly well. And the challenge is where to draw the dividing line. A narrow definition of disease labels the smallest number of people as being sick. Um, the advantage here is that we focus our efforts on the sickest people who stand to benefit the most from treatment. But we miss people who might benefit from treatment because we're only focusing at the very severe end. 
If we go into a broader definition of disease, um, the advantage, of course, is we include everybody who might conceivably benefit. Um, but of course, the problem is that we have overdiagnosis and overtreatment of healthy people, which can be harmful. Ideally, we would hope that we could draw the line based on the benefits and harms to patients by people who had no interest other than the health of the population. Um, but unfortunately, um, I don't mean to, um, to, <laughs> to say anything surprising here, but there are other forces that work on this line. Um, Financial interests, like those of drug companies, device manufacturers, and doctors, tend to push the line further and further towards the well. And whether or not this really helps patients, broadening disease definitions clearly serves other interests. So most diseases themselves are on a spectrum. So they go from mild to severe, for example, um, as Steve talked about before, there's sadness at one end and major depression at the other end. Um, you might have occasional trouble sleeping, or you could have severe insomnia and never be able to sleep. You can have borderline high blood pressure, or you could have severe high blood pressure. And this really matters because the amount of benefit that people get from being treated matters. When you have a mild abnormality, there's much less benefit from treatment than if you have a severe abnormality. And this matters because all treatments have harms. And at the mild end, um, harm often outweighs benefits because you don't have that much to gain and you're subject to the same side effects. Um, at the severe end, it tends to be the benefit often outweighs harms. So diseases are expanding in different ways. Um, the first important way is that we're turning risk factors into diseases. So low bone density becomes osteopenia, or borderline high blood sugar is prediabetes. The other important way we do this is by medicalizing life, by turning ordinary experiences into disease. And I'm going to give you a quick case study of how this has actually happened. So in this case study of a drug in search of a new use and how the media actually helped to create the disease. So GlaxoSmithKline had a third line drug that was going off patent for Parkinson's disease. It had always been a third line treatment and they wanted to stretch out the patent life. And there were reports of the use of this drug for an obscure movement, oops, for an obscure movement disorder. Um, called restless leg syndrome. In fact, in the textbook that I had in medical school, that was what they called it, an obscure medical condition. And what I'm going to tell you is about how GlaxoSmithKline turned this obscure disorder into a recognized medical condition shared by nearly 1 in 10 U.S. adults. And according to the Wall Street Journal, GlaxoSmithKline mounted this campaign to push restless leg syndrome into the consciousness of doctors and patients and consumers alike. Well, you might be wondering, what is restless leg syndrome and do I have it since it's so common? Well, in the late 90s, the International Restless Legs Foundation, a group of mostly industry-funded scientists, operationalized the definition with four criteria, which is often the case in how diseases are defined in these kinds of um, medicalizing life. Um, so the first is an urge to move legs due to an unpleasant feeling in the legs. I'm sure nobody has that in this room now during this long morning session. Um, onset or worsening of symptoms when at rest or not moving around frequently. Partial or complete relief by movement, like walking, for, a long period, for as long as the movement continues. And symptoms which occur primarily at night and which can't interfere with sleep or rest. Um, you're supposed to have all four criteria for the diagnosis, and treatment with drugs is supposed to be reserved for people who have moderate or severe symptoms, which is judged by how often these symptoms occur. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how um, Glaxo tried to co-opt the media through a very vigorous press campaign 
which was about industry-funded surveys, about scientific meeting reports, which hyped the prevalence of the disease and the severity of the syndrome. We looked at the newspaper coverage that happened during this media campaign, and we found 33 news stories in major newspapers that um, were reporting on the disease and the drug. And many of the stories really um, created tremendous fear about the disease and its consequences. Here's what the Telegraph wrote. The condition sounds like a joke, but its consequences can be devastating. Driven to despair by years of sleepless nights, patients have become suicidal. So this is pretty serious. Pay attention. Um, we also looked at how often the stories followed what the industry line was about alerting patients and doctors to this hidden epidemic of disease. You know, before this was obscure, but now we know that all these patients are really suffering. So about half of the stories mentioned that doctors were pretty bad. They really failed to recognize the disease. So um, relatively few doctors know about restless leg syndrome. This is the most common disorder your doctor has never heard of, OK? So the idea that doctors are clearly part of the problem. But it turns out um, that even patients sometimes don't know that they're sick. Um, so in a half of the stories, um, mention the fact that patients with this condition are unaware that they are sick. And this is probably the best quote we found. Restless leg syndrome is quite a serious sleep disorder that affects a lot of people. Their sleep is disturbed, and unless they are really awake, they'll not be aware of it. So they're sleeping through their symptoms. Um, so, um, but just for balance, we did look to see whether any of these news stories mentioned whether there could be too much diagnosis. Does anyone want to take a guess? Zero, Zero yes. Um, the third way that diseases are expanding is that we change the rules by lowering the cutoff of disease. For example, the cutoff of diabetes was lowered from the fasting blood sugar of 140 to blood sugar of 126, going to the mild side. The same thing has happened for hypertension, cholesterol, and obesity, and often by expert panels who have substantial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. So expanding disease definitions creates big markets, and it creates more and more patients who are, um, who are less likely to benefit from treatment. Well, what interests are promoting overdiagnosis? Well, that's easy, right? There's lots of interest in turning people into patients. The most obvious is industry, um, the pharma who wants to expand the market for its products. Drug companies you know, pay for clinical trials. They subsidize physician education, physician detailing and advertising. They fund disease advocacy groups, which is called AstroTurf, fake grassroots organizations. <laughs> um, they conduct disease awareness campaigns. And they run, of course, um, direct-to-consumer ad campaigns. But health systems also have an interest in competing for patients, for example, by advertising various services at their hospital or holding free screenings, which Otis has written um, powerfully about. Um, then, of course, there's malpractice concerns. Um, clinicians are sued for underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis, but I don't think we've ever heard, and maybe somebody will tell us, somebody being sued for overdiagnosis. And then, of course, there's true believers who want to, inc both doctors and patients, who just really believe in the disease and they want to increase public awareness. And then the media, of course, it's very attractive, this new hidden epidemic that nobody knows about. Um, the miracle cure, um, and that helps them to attract readers and get them on the front page. Um, and then it's also that diseases compete for funding within our um, research infrastructure. This is an organizational chart of our National Institutes of Health here, and as you can see, it's all organized around different diseases. And um, the problem is that institutes and researchers benefit from having larger and larger numbers of patients affected by their disease, because that helps them to make the case to argue for more funding. So as you can see, self-interests are served in each case by expanding the pool of patients. And that's a recipe for too much medicine. 
But the good news <laughs> is that um, we're at a tipping point, that um, overdiagnosis is now, I think, um, a part of medicine and the media. Some people have been worrying about overdiagnosis, I would say probably lots of people in this room, for a long time, but it's sort of felt like a fringe movement on the side. Um, but it seems like we finally reached this tipping point, and efforts like the BMJ's Too Much Medicine, JAM Internal Medicine's Less Is More series, the Choosing Wisely campaign have all made a big difference. And overdiagnosis is now increasingly showing up in the medical literature. This is a graph over time of the number of unique articles that just mention overdiagnosis in the title or abstract. And um, also in the news media, um, this is now really changing um, where I think this is becoming an issue which people are paying attention to. And perhaps most importantly, it's made it to the Colbert Report, which is our favorite political satire show. And um, we're hoping that overdiagnosis after this conference gets the Colbert bump. Um, but, um, and Colbert is a faux investigative journalist, and he's also a faux Dartmouth alum because he pretends to be a conservative, but he's really a liberal. And this is what he had to say about low T. A man on TV is selling me a miracle cure, and that will keep me young forever. It's called Androgel for treating something called low T, a pharmaceutical company recognized condition, <laughs> affecting millions of men and low testosterone, previously known as getting older. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this is really amazing because these messages, I think, are really powerful. But um, just a few details remain, right? Um, really how to define <laughs> overdiagnosis, how can we really operationalize what overdiagnosis is, how can we measure it to grapple with some of the methodologic issues that come up with measurement, how can we communicate what are often counterintuitive and complex ideas to doctors, patients, and policymakers, and finally, how can we take action to change the healthcare system so we can limit harms from overdiagnosis? Um, so in the next three days, we're going to have plenary sessions each morning, like today, <laughs> and um, they have different themes. Then we're going to have on the last day a medical journal pa panel where et medical journal editors are going to talk about what, can what they can or should be doing about overdiagnosis and what they're looking for from authors when they're writing about these topics. We're going to have concurrent sessions um, and workshops. Um, and in case people didn't notice, um, there's a credit card-like um, thumb drive, and if you open it up, you'll see that we have an ecologically correct form of all of the abstracts if you want to read them. Um, so they're not in the main program, but um, they're accessible here. And then we'll also have a poster session. And you know, this conference is just the beginning. And what we want to do is help establish the way forward. And one of the ways that we're going to do this is by having work groups in research, education, communication, and policy. And then what we're going to have each workshop, work group do is to generate a top five list, a maximum of five, um, of sort of two things. What is happening now and priorities for the future, the wish list of the most important things we could be doing. And then at the end of the conference that we'll draft a conference statement which we'll disseminate as one of the outputs of the conference. The day two session, what we'd like to do is to have people who are interested in really leading efforts in each of these areas come to those sessions. Anyone is welcome to come, but we're interested in people who really want to do work. And then day three, anyone who's interested in that area can come and you don't have to feel like you have to do a lot of work, you can just be interested. Um, and we hope that this will um, help to encourage new collaborations and help us move forward. So, thank you. So you just you can just you can just push this here. It was amazing what was on that beach. Um, so. So uh, I'd like to introduce the next